We're beginning this talk, which is concerning the Orthodox worldview. I'd like to say a word on why it is important to have an Orthodox worldview, or rather, why it is more difficult to have one today than it was in past centuries. In past centuries, for example, in Russia in the 19th century, the early part of this, what we can call an Orthodox worldview, was uh, inseparable part of daily life. It was supported by the life around it. In fact, there was no need really to speak of a separate thing, which was called the Orthodox worldview, because it was simply the same thing as leading an Orthodox life. In many countries, as in Russia, the government itself confessed Orthodox religion. It was the center of public functions, and the king, and the ruler himself, was the first Orthodox layman with the responsibility to give a Christian example to all of his subjects. Every city had Orthodox churches. Large cities had many Orthodox churches. Instead of Moscow, had 40 times 40, some 1,600 or so churches. Many of these churches had services every day, morning and evening. There were monasteries in all the great cities, in many small cities, outside the cities, and in the countryside, in deserts and wildernesses. In Russia, there were over a thousand monasteries altogether, officially organized monasteries, in addition to other more unofficial groups. And monasticism was an accepted part of life. Most families, in fact, had somewhere in them a sister, or a brother, an uncle, a grandfather, a cousin, or someone who was a monk or a nun. In addition to all the other kinds of Orthodox uh, examples of Orthodox life, people who wandered from monastery to monastery, fools for Christ, the whole way of life is permeated by Orthodox kinds of people which, of course, monasticism is descent. Orthodox customs are a part of daily life. Most books that were commonly read were Orthodox. And daily life itself was a very difficult thing for most people without modern conveniences. People had to work hard to survive. Life expectancy was not great. Death was a frequent reality. And all of this reinforced the Church's teaching on the other world, which was real and near. Everyone could plainly see how true it was. So living an Orthodox life in such circumstances was really the same thing as having an Orthodox worldview. And there was really no need to talk about such things in Orthodox worldview. Today, on the other hand, all this has changed. It changed very drastically. Our Orthodoxy is a little island in the midst of a world which operates on totally different principles. Every day, these principles are changing for the worse, making us, who are Orthodox Christians, more and more alienated from it. Many people are tempted to divide their lives into two sharply distinct categories. The daily life we get at work, with worldly friends and our worldly business, and orthodoxy which we get on Sundays and other times in the week when we have time for it. But the worldview of such a person who divides his life up this way, if we look closely at it, is often a strange combination of Christian values and worldly values, which really do not mix together very well at all. The purpose of this talk, therefore, is to see how people living today can begin to make their worldview more of one piece, to make it a whole Orthodox worldview. Orthodoxy is life. If we don't live Orthodoxy, we simply are not Orthodox, no matter what form of beliefs we might hold. This is the basic principle I would like to expound upon in this statement. Life today in our contemporary world has become very artificial, very uncertain, very confusing. It is true orthodoxy has the life of its own, but it is also not very far from the life of the world around us. And so, the life of the orthodox Christian, even when he's being just purely orthodox, cannot help but reflect the life around us in some way. And so, a kind of uncertainty and confusion have also entered into orthodox life in our times. In this talk, I will try to look at contemporary life and then at our orthodox life to see how better we might fulfill our Christian obligation to lead otherworldly lives even in these quite terrible times. To have an orthodox Christian view of the whole of life today that will enable us to survive these times with our faith intact. Probably there will be all kinds of questions and discussion about this which will go into the end. The purpose, of course, for which we're doing this is survival, so that we might be able to survive as Orthodox Christians. 
Today, when it looks at our contemporary life from the perspective of the normal life lived by people in earlier times, say Russia or America or any country of Western Europe in the 19th century, cannot help but be struck by the fact how abnormal life has become today. The whole concept of authority and obedience, of decency and politeness, of public and private behavior, all have changed drastically. But in turn, in fact, upside down, except in a few isolated people, usually Christians of some kind, to try to preserve the so-called old-fashioned way of life. Our abnormal life today can be characterized as spoiled or pampered. From infancy, today's child, as a general rule, is treated like a little god or goddess in the family. His whims are catered to, his desires fulfilled, he is surrounded by toys, amusements, comforts. He is not trained or seldom trained, very, very well trained, or brought up according to strict principles of Christian behavior, but left to develop whichever way his desires incline. Usually it's enough for the child to say, I want it, or I won't do it, for his obliging parents to bow down before him and let him have his way. Perhaps this does not happen all the time in every family, but it happens often enough to be the rule of contemporary childhood. And even the best intentioned parents do not entirely escape from this influence. And if they try to raise the child strictly, the neighbors are doing something else. And they have to take that into consideration in discipline the child. When such a child becomes an adult, he naturally surrounds himself with the same things he is used to in his childhood. With comfort, amusements, and grown-up toys. Life becomes a constant search for fun, which by the way is a word which is totally unheard of in any other vocabulary. In 19th century Russia wouldn't have understood what this word means. Any civilized, serious civilization. Life is a constant search for fun, which is so empty of any serious meaning that a visitor from any 19th century country, looking at our popular television programs, amusement parks, advertisements, movies, music, and almost any aspect of our popular culture, would think he has stumbled across the land of imbeciles. We have lost all contact with normal reality. We don't often take that into consideration because we are living in this society and we take it for granted. But really, from outside of country, in, and often a person just from a country of Eastern Europe comes in. Where they have a very tough life and sees how strange this way of life is that we think is normal. Some recent observers of our contemporary life have called the young people of today the me generation. In our times, the age of narcissism, self-worship, characterized by a worship of and fascination with oneself that prevents a normal human life from developing. Others have spoken of the plastic universe or fantasy world which so many people live today, unable to face or come to terms with the reality of the world around them or the problems within themselves. When the media generation turns to religion, which has been happening very frequently in the past several decades, it is usually to a plastic or fantasy form of religion. A religion of self-development, where the self remains the object of worship, of brainwashing and mind control, of deified gurus and swamis, of the pursuit of UFOs and extraterrestrial beings, of abnormal states and feelings. There's no need to go into all these right here. These manifestations are probably familiar to all of you in some form or other. Later on, we'll discuss a little how these touch on the Orthodox Christian spiritual life of our days. It is important for us to realize, as we try ourselves to lead a Christian life today, that the world which has been formed by our pampered times makes demands on the soul, whether in religion or in secular life, which are what one has to call totalitarian. This is easy enough to see in the mind-bending cults that have received so much publicity in recent years, which demand total allegiance to a self-made holy man. But it is just as evident in secular life, where one is confronted not just by individual temptation here or there, but by a constant state of temptation, the tax one, whether in the background music heard everywhere in markets and businesses, in the public signs and billboards on city streets, in the rock music which is brought everywhere by its devotees, even to forest campgrounds and trails, and in the home itself where television often becomes the secret ruler of the household, dictating modern values, opinions, and tastes. If you have young children, you know how true this is. This is in television, how difficult it is to fight against this new opinion which has been 
Jordan as a majority as a majority. The message of this universal temptation, which occurs in all these various forms, which attacks men today, and quite openly in the secular forms, but really more hidden when it becomes religious, is something like the following motto. Live for the present. Enjoy yourself. Relax. Be comfortable. In fact, these very phrases become part of our everyday talk. It's quite distinct from earlier times. Behind this message is another, more sinister undertone, which is openly expressed only in the, in the officially atheist countries, which are one step ahead of the free world in this respect. In fact, we should realize that what is happening in the world today is very similar, whether it occurs behind the curtain or in the free world. There are different varieties of it, but a very similar attack is being made to get our soul. In the communist countries, which have an do official doctrine of atheism, they tell quite openly that you are to forget about God, forget about any other life at the present one, remove from your life the fear of God and reverence for holy things, regard those who still believe in God in the old-fashioned way as enemies who must be exterminated. One might take as a symbol of our carefree, fun-loving, self-worshipping times our American Disneyland. But if so, we should not neglect to see behind it the more sinister symbol that shows where the new generation is really heading. This symbol is what is well known in Eastern countries under communism, the Soviet Gulag. The chain of concentration camps that still govern the life of nearly half the world population. Well, does all this have to do with us who are trying to lead as best we can a sober Orthodox Christian life? has a lot to do. We have to realize that the life around us, that normal world is, is the place where we begin our own Christian life. Whatever we make of our life, whatever truly Christian content we give to it, it still has something of the stamp of the me generation on it. And we have to be humble enough to see this. This is where we begin. There are two false approaches to the life around us that many often make today, thinking that somehow this is what Orthodox Christians should be doing. One approach, the most common one, is simply to go along with the times. Adapt yourself to rock, music, modern fashions and tastes, and the whole rhythm of our jazzed up modern life. Often the more old-fashioned parents will have little contact with this life and live their own life more or less separately. But they will smile and visit their children follow after the latest craze and think this is something harmless. This path is total disaster if we want to live a Christian life. It is something that produces the death of the soul. There are some, some who can still lead an awkwardly respectable life without struggling against the spirit of the times, which is manifest in all these popular movements. But inwardly, such people are dead or dying. And the saddest thing of all, their children will pay the price. Various psychic and spiritual disorders and sicknesses will become more and more commonplace. There are a few examples I might give. One of the leading members of the suicide cult that ended so spectacularly four years ago in Jonestown was the young daughter of a Greek Orthodox priest. Satanic rock groups like KISS, Kids and Sacred Service, are made up of ex-Russian Orthodox young people. The largest part of the membership of the Temple of Satan in San Francisco, according to a recent sociological survey, is made up of Orthodox boys. These are only a few striking cases. Most Orthodox young people don't go so far astray. They just blend in with the anti-Christian world around them and cease to be examples of any kind of Christianity for those who look at them. This, of course, is wrong to take Christianity seriously. The Christian must be different from the world, above all from today's weird and normal world. And this must be one of the basic things he knows as part of his Christian upbringing. Otherwise, there's no point in calling ourselves Christians at all, much less Orthodox Christians. The false approach at the other extreme is what one might call fake spirituality. As translations of Orthodox books on the spiritual life become more widely available, and the Orthodox vocabulary of spiritual struggle is placed more and more in the air, one finds an increasing number of people talking about hesychasm, the Jesus prayer, the ascetic life, exalted states of prayer, and all manner of things like that. And the most exalted holy fathers like St. Simeon and Theologian, St. Gregory Palamas, St. Gregory Sinai, and many others. It is all, of course, very well to be aware of this fully exalted side of Orthodox spiritual life, and to have reverence for the great saints that actually lived. But unless we have a very realistic and very humble awareness of how far away all of us today are from the life of Hezekiah, and how little prepared we are even to approach it, 
Our interest in it is only one more expression of our self-centered plastic universe. The new generation goes hezy gas. That is what some people are trying to do today. But in actuality, they're only adding a new game called hezy gasm to the attractions of Disneyland. There are books of the subject now, very popular. In fact, Roman Cassis is doing very big for this kind of thing. And there are orthodox influence, and themselves also of influencing other orthodox people. For example, there is uh, a Jesuit, is a Jesuit priest, Maloney, who writes all kinds of books and trans and translations and requires the grades that seem to be theologian, tries to get people to enter in everyday life to be hesitant. They have all kinds of retreats, usually charismatic. People are inspired by the Holy Spirit, supposedly, and have to take all kinds of these disciplines which we get from other fathers, which are far beyond the level in which we are today. It's a very unserious thing. There's also a lady, she was born in Russia, in the Catholic, who writes books called Pustinia, about the desert life. Today. Malchania. Malchania is a silent life. And all these things which he tries to, to put into life like that you have some passion for some kind of new candy. This, of course, is very unserious and it's a very tragic side of our time. These kind of exalted things are being used by people who have no idea what they're all about. Some people, some people, it's only a habit or a pastime. For other people who take it seriously, it can be a great tragedy. They think they're leading some kind of exalted life and really they haven't even come to terms with their own problems inside. Let me then re emphasize that both these extremes are to be avoided both worldliness and super spirituality. But this does not mean that we should not have a realistic awareness of the legitimate demands which the world makes upon us. Or that we should cease respecting and taking sound instruction from the great as and guest fathers and using the Jesus prayer ourselves according to our circumstances and capacity. This has to be on our level, down to earth. The point is, this point is absolutely necessary for our survival as well as in these perilous times. We must realize our situation as well as Christians today. We must realize deeply what times we are living in, how little we actually know and feel our orthodoxy, how far we are, not just from the saints in ancient times, and even touch them, but even from the ordinary orthodox Christians of a hundred years ago, or even a generation ago. And how much we must humble ourselves just to survive as well as Christians today. More specifically, what can we do to gain this awareness, this realization, and how can we make it fruitful in our lives? So I'll try to answer this question in two parts. First, concerning our awareness of the world around us, which has never before in the history of Christianity has become our conscious enemy. And second, concerning our awareness of orthodoxy, which I'm afraid most of us know much less than we should, and much less than we have to, in order to wish to keep it. First is whether we wish it or not, we are in the world, and it's a text that felt strongly wherever you are today, even in a remote place like the monastery here. Therefore, we must face it, and this temptation, squarely and realistically, but without giving in to it. In particular, we must prepare our young people for the temptations facing them, and as it were, inoculate them against the temptation. We must be aware that the world around us seldom helps and almost always hinders the upbringing of a child in the true orthodox spirit. We must be ready to answer to every day to answer the influence of the world or the principles of a sound Christian upbringing. This means, to go into a few more specific points, that what a child learns at school must be constantly checked and corrected at home. You can't assume that he's going to learn in school is something simply that's profitable or secular and has nothing to do with his orthodox outlook on life. So a generation ago, you could have assumed that more or less. Now, no longer do that. A child may be taught useful skills and facts in schools, although many schools in America today are fairly miserable even with this. In fact, many school teachers tell us that all they can do is keep the children in good order in class without even teaching them anything. But even if he gets this much, which few are getting, he's also taught many wrong attitudes and philosophy. The child's basic attitude towards an appreciation of literature, music, history, art, philosophy, even science, and of course life and religion, must come first of all not from school, because the school will give us all mixed up with modern philosophies. It must come first from the home and the church, or else the child is bound to be miseducated in today's world. The public education is at best agnostic and at worst openly atheistic or anti-religious. Of course, the Soviet Union, all this is forced upon the child. There's no religion whatsoever. And it's an active program of making the child atheist. America is not so bad. Perhaps in some places it's not bad. 
Senator Fred, parents must know exactly what is being taught their children in sex education courses, as well as universities and American schools. And this must be corrected at home. Not only by a frank attitude to this subject, especially between fathers and sons, a very rare thing in American society, but by, also by a clear setting forth of the moral aspects, uh, which is totally absent in public education. The required parents must know just what kind of music their children are listening to, what is in the movies they see, listening and seeing together with them when necessary, what kind of language they are exposed to, what kind of language they use, and various other points of common everyday life, and the Christian answer a Christian attitude given to all of us. Television in households where there is not enough courage to throw it out the window must be strictly controlled and supervised to avoid the poisonous effects of this machine which has become the leading educator of anti-Christian attitudes and ideas in the home itself, especially to the young. I speak about the raising of children because this is where the world first strikes its blows that are those Christians and forms them in its image. Once wrong attitudes have been formed in a child, the task of giving them a Christian education becomes doubly difficult. But it is not only children, it is all of us who are facing the world which is trying to form us in anti-Christianity. That means of schools, television, movies, popular music, and all the other influences that pound in upon us, most of all in the big cities. So we have to be aware that what is being pounded in upon us is it's all of one piece. It has a certain rhythm, a certain message to give us, this message of self-worship, of relaxing, of letting go, of enjoying yourself, of giving up anything that you ever Various forms of music, or movies, television, listening in target schools, the way subjects are emphasized, the way the background is given, everything else is one particular thing that is being given to us. It's actually an education in unbelief. So the dream is an education in atheism. We have to fight back by knowing just what the world is trying to do to us and by formulating and communicating our orthodox Christian response. Frankly, from observing the way orthodox families in today's world live and pass on their orthodoxy, we will see that this battle is more often lost than won. The percentage of orthodox Christians who retain their orthodox identity in fact and are not changed into the image of today's world is rather small. I don't mean just people who continue to go to church on Sundays because many people who go to church on Sundays are not very aware of what their religion is all about. However, having said this much, I must say now that it is not necessary to view the world around us as all bad. If it was, there would be almost no hope for us. In fact, for our survival as well as us Christians, we have to be smart enough to use whatever is positive in the world for our benefit. Here I'll go into a few points where we can use something in the world that seems to be nothing to do directly with orthodoxy in order to formulate our orthodox worldview. For example, Child has been exposed in his earliest years to good classical music, and has seen his soul being developed by it, but not be nearly as tempted by the crude rhythms and message of rock and other contemporary forms of pseudo music as someone who has grown up without a musical education. Such a musical education, as several of the often held youth said, defines the soul and prepares it for the reception of spiritual impressions. The child, the second boy, the child has been educated in good literature, drama, and poetry, has felt a effect in his own soul, in his belief, enjoyed them, will not easily become an addict to the contemporary movies and television programs and cheap novels which devastate the soul and take it away from the past. Another point is the child who has learned to see beauty in classical painting and sculpture will not easily be drawn into the, the perversity of contemporary art but be attracted by the garish products of modern advertising and pornography. Another very important point, the child who knows something of the history of the world, especially in Christian times, and how other people have lived and thought, what mistakes and pitfalls people have fallen into by departing from God, and his commandments, and what glorious and influential lives they have lived when they were faithful to him, will be discerning about the life and philosophy of our own times, and will not be inclined to follow the first new philosophy or way of life he accomplished. Basic problems facing people educating children today is that in the schools they are no longer given a sense of history. That anybody has lived before us. Anybody who knows anything about history before the Second World War is considered ancient history. Right? It's a very it's a dangerous, fatal kind of a thing to give a child because it means he has no ability to take examples from the way people lived in the past. And actually, history constantly repeats itself. Once you see that, it becomes interesting. It becomes interesting how people are falling into the same traps today. And you can see how people answer this, how people have answered in the past, how there have been people who went against God and what results came from that, how people changed.
lived their life, they came exceptions. They came exceptions which is their job for a long time. But the sense of history is a very important thing that should be communicated. In general, the person who is well acquainted with the best products of secular culture, which in the West almost always have definite religious and Christian overtones, has a much better chance of leading a normal, fruitful, orthodox life than someone who knows only the popular culture of today. The one who is converted to orthodoxy straight from rock culture, anyone who thinks he can com combine orthodoxy with that kind of culture, has much suffering to go through and a difficult road in life before he can become a truly serious orthodox Christian and is capable of handing on his faith to others. Without this suffering, without this awareness, orthodox parents will raise children who will be devoured by the contemporary world promise. The world's best culture, properly received, refines and develops the soul. Today's popular culture triples and deforms the soul and hinders it from having a full and normal response to the message of orthodoxy. Therefore, in our battle against the spirit of this world, we can use the best things the world has to offer in order to go beyond them. Everything good in the world, if we are only wise enough to see it, points to God and to the orthodoxy. We have to make it. With such an attitude, a view of both of the world, the good things in the world and the bad things in the world, it is possible for us to have and to live an orthodox worldview. That is, an orthodox view on the whole of life, not just a narrow church structure. There exists a false opinion, which unfortunately is all too widespread today, that it is enough to have an orthodoxy that is limited to the church building and formal orthodox activities, such as praying at certain times or making the sign of the cross. And everything else, so this opinion goes, one can be like anyone else, participating in the life and culture of our time without any problem, as long as we don't commit sin. Anyone who has come to realize how deep orthodoxy is and how full is the commitment which is required of the serious orthodox Christian, and likewise what totalitarian demands the contemporary world is making on us, will easily see how wrong this opinion is. One is orthodox all the time, every day, in every situation of life, but one is not really orthodox at all. Our orthodoxy is revealed not just in our strictly religious views, but everything we do and say. Most of us are very unaware of the Christian religious responsibility we have for the seemingly secular part of our lives. A person with a truly orthodox worldview lives every part of his life as orthodox and Christian. Let us therefore ask here how can we nourish and support this orthodox worldview in our daily life? That is, what is the orthodox things that strengthen us? There's those that are added to those worldly things which we already mentioned as helping out here. The first and most obvious way is to be in constant contact with the sources of Christian nourishment. Everything that the church gives for our enlightenment and salvation. Church services and holy mysteries, holy scripture, the lives of saints, the writings of the holy fathers. We must, of course, read books that are on one's own level of understanding. But apply the church's teachings to one's own circumstances in life. Then they can be fruitful in guiding us and changing us in a Christian way. But often these basic Christian sources do not have their full effect on us, or they don't really affect us at all, because we don't have the right Christian attitude towards them, towards the Christian life they're supposed to inspire. Let me say a word here about what our attitude should be if we are to obtain real benefit from them, and is there going to be for us the beginning of a truly orthodox worldview? First of all, Christian spiritual food, by its very nature, is something which is living and nourishing. If our attitude towards it is only academic and bookish, we will fail to get the benefit it is meant to give. Therefore, if we read orthodox books, or are interested in orthodoxy only to gain information, but to show off our knowledge to others, we are missing the point. If we learn of the commandments of God and the laws of His Church, merely so we can be correct and judge the incorrectness of others, we are missing the point. These things must not merely affect our ideas, they must directly touch our lives and change them. In any time of great crisis in human affairs, such as the critical times right in front of us in the free world, it's a matter not, not of centuries or decades, it's a matter of year, two years or months in front of us, critical times. In these times, those who place their trust in outward knowledge, in laws and canons and correctness, will be unable to stand. The strong ones then will be those whose orthodox education has given them a feel of what is truly Christian. Those whose orthodoxy is in the heart and 
has capable of touching other hearts. Nothing is more tragic than to see someone who is raised in orthodoxy, has a certain idea of the catechism, who's built some lives of the state, was the general outline of what orthodoxy stands for, and stands for the services, and then is totally unaware of what is going on around him. And he has children, and gives to his children this life in two categories. One is the way most people live, and another way is the way orthodox live on Sundays, and when they're reading orthodox texts. The child was raised like that, is most likely not going to take the orthodox. It's going to be a very small part of his life. Because the contemporary life is too attractive. Too many people are going for it. It's too much a part of reality today. Unless he can really talk how to approach it, how to guard himself against the bad effects of it, and how to take the good things which are in the world. Therefore, second point, our attitude beginning right now must be down to earth and normal. We say this at the time and everything has become very abnormal and weird. That is, our attitude must be applied to the real circumstances of our life. It cannot be a product of fantasy and escapism and refusal to face the often unpleasant facts of the world around us. If our orthodoxy is too exalted, too much in the clouds, it belongs in a hothouse and is incapable of helping us in our daily life, let alone saying anything for the salvation of those around us. Our world is quite cruel and wounds souls with its harshness. And we have to respond, first of all, with down to earth Christian love and understanding, leaving accounts of hesychasm and advanced forms of prayer to those capable of receiving them. So, also, our attitude must be not self centered, but reaching out to those who are seeking for God and for a godly life. Nowadays, whenever there is a good sized Orthodox community, the temptation is to make it into a society for self congratulation, for taking delight in our Orthodox virtues and achievements. The beauty of our church buildings and furnishings, the splendor of our services, even the purity of our doctrine. But the true Christian life, ever since the time of the apostles, has always been inseparable from communicating it to others. An orthodoxy that is alive, by this very fact, shines forth to others. And there is no need to open a department of missions to do this. The fire of true Christianity communicates itself with others. If our orthodoxy is only something we keep for ourselves and boast about it, then we are the dead burying the dead, which is precisely the state of many of our orthodox parishes today, even those that have a large number of young people. We are not going deeply into their faith. It's not enough to say the young people are going to church, and to ask what are they getting in church, what are they taking away from church. If they are not making orthodoxy a part of their whole life, then not the they are going to church. Likewise, another point, our orthodoxy must be loving and forgiving. There's a kind of hardness which has crept into orthodox life today. You say things like, that man is a heretic, don't go near him. Or that one is orthodox, supposedly, but you can't really be sure. Or that one there is obviously a spy. <laughs> See, it's a fairly common thing. <laughs> Often we don't mean this too seriously, but the attitude is a very cruel one, and it can become very hard and harsh. No one will deny that the church is surrounded by enemies today, or that there are some who are still taking advantage of our trust and confidence. But this is the way it has been since the time of the apostles, and the Christian life has always been something of a risk in this practical way. But even if we are sometimes taken advantage of, in fact, new Christians in places like Ghana and Africa would really take their Christianity seriously. They, they read the gospel, they begin to act according to the gospel. They give themselves up and kiss them on the cheek and turn the other cheek. They give away things without expecting anything in return. And the pagans who live in places like Ghana and Nigeria, they delight in this because they see how hard as a Christian we can take advantage of. We'll take something, you won't expect it back. <laughs> and Christians, of course, they do it in good faith. And they get the reward for that, even though they're taking advantage of it. Of course, we have to be, we have to show some caution, so we are simply done in completely. But still, we cannot give up our basic attitude of love and trust. Because without that, we lose one of the very foundations of our Christian life. The world which has no Christ, is more true than ever, the world is good if the world has no Christ, even that sometimes talks about it, but it has to be mistrustful and cold. But Christians, on the contrary, have to be loving and open. Or else we will lose the salt of Christ within us and become just like the world, which for nothing but to be cast out and trodden on the foot. A little humility of looking at ourselves will help us to be more generous and forgiving of the faults of others. We love often to judge others for the strangeness of their behavior. We often call them cuckoos, or, in particular, phrase used nowadays, crazy comments. 
It is, of course, true that we should beware of really unbalanced people that have made harm in the church. But one should ask the question, what serious was it as Christians? Jay is not a little crazy. We don't fit in with the ways of the world. If we do, in today's world, which has become so weird, we aren't serious Christians. A true Christian today cannot be at home in the world. He cannot help but feel himself and be regarded by others as a little crazy. Finally, our Christian attitude must be what? For want of a better word, I can call something which is very unfashionable today, innocent. Today, the world places a high value on sophistication, on being worldly wise, on being a professional. Orthodoxy places no value on these qualities. They kill the Christian soul. And yet these qualities constantly creep into the church and into our lives. Often one hears enthusiastic converts, especially, express their desire of going to the great Orthodox centers, the cathedrals and monasteries where sometimes thousands of the faithful come together. Everywhere the talk is of church matters, and one can feel how important Orthodoxy is after all. That is, Orthodoxy is a small drop in the bucket when you look at the whole society, and those great cathedrals and monasteries with so many people it seems as though it's a really important thing. It makes us feel important. And how often one sees these same people in a pitiful state after they have indulged their desires, returning from these great Orthodox centers, sour and dissatisfied, filled with worldly church gossip and criticism, anxious above all to be correct and proper and worldly wise about church politics. In a word, they have lost their innocence, their unworldliness, being led astray by their fascination with the worldly side of the church's life. In various forms, this is a temptation to everyone today, to the church. We must fight it by not allowing ourselves to overvalue the externals of the church, but always returning to the one thing needed, Christ and the salvation of our souls from this wicked generation. We do not need to be ignorant of what goes on in the world and in the church. In fact, for our own self-defense, we have to know something of this. But our knowledge must be practical and simple and single-minded, not sophisticated and not worldly. It is obvious for any Orthodox Christian with some awareness of what Orthodoxy is, some awareness of what the world looks like today, who looks at the world from the point of view of Orthodoxy, the Orthodox world view, it's obvious that our world is coming to its end. The signs of the times are so obvious that one might say that the world is coming to crash into its end. What are some of these signs? First of all, the abnormality of the world. Never have such weird and unnatural manifestations and behavior been accepted as a matter of course in long days. Just look at the world around you, what some of the newspapers, what kind of movies are being shown, what's on the television, what it is that people think interesting and amusing that they laugh at. It's absolutely weird. And there are people who deliberately promote this, of course, for their own benefit, for their own money, and also because that's the fashion, because there's a kind of perverse craving for this kind of thing. Another thing, the wars, the rumors of wars, each more cold and merciless than the one preceding it, and all overshadowed by the threat of the unthinkable universal nuclear war, which can be set off with a touch of a button, which has become very much in the news in the air in the last year. So we become aware that the heat is a very real possibility. Again, the widespread natural disasters, earthquakes, and now volcanoes. The newest one forming not far from here, near Yosemite Park in Central California, which are already changing the world's weather patterns. Again, the increasing centralization of information on and power over the individuals, represented in particular by the enormous new computer of Luxembourg, which has the capacity to keep a file of information on every man living. Another point, the multiplication of false Christs and false antichrists. The latest candidate, just this summer, spent probably millions of dollars advertising his impending appearance on world television, promising to give, at that time, a telepathic message to all the world's inhabitants. Quite apart from any occult powers which might be involved in such events, we already know well enough the opportunities for presenting subliminal messages by radio and especially by television, as well as the fact that this can be done by anyone with the technology for breaking into man to normal radio and television signals. No matter how many laws there might be against it. Another point, the truly weird response to the new movie everyone in America is talking about and seeing, E.T., the extraterrestrial, has caused literally millions of seemingly normal people to express their affection and love for the hero, who is a savior from outer space, who is quite obviously a demon. And all this is an obvious preparation for the version of the coming Antichrist. Instead, the movie editor was a, was a review of the North of North America of this film, which didn't show all these. There was also a review of this film in one of the recent uh, newspapers of the Greek Archdiocese. And the, the priest who 
really good. It's a wonderful movie that can teach us about love and everything to feel. It's a very wider contrast between people who are trying to be aware of what's going on and those who are simply led into the mood of the times. I could go on with details like this, but my purpose is not to frighten you, but to make you aware of what is happening around us. It is truly later than we think. The apocalypse is now. And how tragic it is to see Christians, and above all, Orthodox young people, with this incalculable tragedy hanging over their heads, will think they can continue what is called a normal life in these terrible times, participating fully in the whims of this silly, self-worshipping generation, totally unaware that the fool's paradise we are living in is about to crash and completely unprepared for the desperate times that lie just ahead of us. There is no longer even a question of being a good or a poor Orthodox Christian. The question now is, will our faith survive at all? With many, it will not survive. The coming Antichrist will be too attractive, too much in the spirit of the worldly things we now crave, for most men even to know that they have lost their Christianity without doubt to him. Still, the call of Christ comes to us. Let us, after becoming aware of these things, begin at last to pay attention to the clearest expression of this call today is coming from the enslaved atheist world, where there is real suffering for Christ, the seriousness of life which, is, which we are rapidly losing and have already lost. One Orthodox priest in Romania, Father George Calcio, who is now near death in a communist prison, for daring to challenge young seminarians and students to put off their blind allegiance to the spiritual times and come forward to labor for Christ, he gave a series of talks in 1978, for which he received a sentence of 10 years concentration camp, and after which he was subjected to meetings, we published in the last speech of Orthodox work contained the first installment, two parts, with seven talks, addressed to young people, because he speaks to people who have been raised as atheists, so the situation is a little more drastic than we have here, but basically, the battle is the same. After speaking of the emptiness of atheism, he tells today's young people, quote, I call you to a much higher flight, to total abandonment, to an act of courage which defies reason. I call you to God, to the one that transcends the world, so that you might know an infinite heaven of spiritual joy, the heaven which you presently grope for in your personal hell, and which you seek even while in a state of non-deliberate revolt. Jesus has always loved you, but now you have the choice to respond to his invitation. In responding, you are ordained to go and bear fruit that will remain to be a prophet of Christ in the world in which you live, to love your neighbor as yourself, and to make all men your friends, to proclaim by every action this unique and limitless love which has raised man from the level of a slave to that of a friend of God, to be the prophet of this liberating love which delivers you from all constraint, returning to you your integrity as you offer yourself to God." End of quote. Father George, speaking to young people who had little inspiration to serve Christ's church because they had accepted the worldly opinion, which is common also in the free world, that the church is only a set of buildings or a worldly organization, calls them and us to a deeper awareness of Christ's church and of how our formal membership in it, in it is not enough to save us. He says, quote, The church of Christ is alive and free. In her we move and have our being, through Christ who is her head. In him we have full freedom. In the church we learn of truth, and the truth will set us free. You are in Christ's church whenever you uplift someone bent down in sorrow, or when you give alms to the poor and visit the sick. You are in Christ's church when you cry out, Lord, help me. You are in Christ's church when you are good and patient, when you refuse to get angry at your brother, even if he has wounded your feelings. You are in Christ's church when you pray, Lord, forgive him. When you work honestly at your job, returning home weary in the evenings, and with a smile upon your lips. When you repay evil with love, you are in Christ's church. Do you not see, therefore, young friend, how close the church of Christ is? You are Peter, and God is building his church upon you. You are the rock of his church, against which nothing can prevail. Let us build churches with our faith, churches which no human power can pull down, a church whose foundation is Christ. Feel for your brother alongside him. Never ask, who is he? Rather say, he is no stranger, he is my brother. He is the church of Christ, just as I am. End of quote. With such a call in our hearts, let us begin really to belong to the church of Christ, the Orthodox Church. Outward membership is not enough. Something must move within us that makes us different from the world around us. 
even if that world calls itself Christian and even Orthodox. Let us keep and nourish those qualities of the true Orthodox worldview, which I mentioned earlier. A living, normal attitude, loving and forgiving, not self-centered, preserving our innocence and unworldliness, even with a full and humble awareness of our own sinfulness and the power of the worldly temptations which surround us. If we truly live this Orthodox worldview, our faith will survive the shocks ahead of us and be a source of inspiration and salvation for those who will still be seeking Christ even amidst the shipwreck of humanity which has already begun today.